Welcome everyone to the teaching and learning call for Aperio and Sakai on uh, Wednesday, July 8th. Um, we have a uh, packed uh, agenda today. Um, we're going to do project updates, uh, UX, get some UX feedback on Morpheus, which is a responsive design for Sakai 11. Uh, if there's time, we'll also, we have a Jira of the Week we'll, we'll cover, and then our main topic today is uh, Zerte demonstration and discussion. And then we'll try and leave time as well to discuss, uh, discuss future meetings and topics because we like to keep, you know, keep that moving. Um, and then wrapping up. So let's get started here. Uh, first of all, just curious if there are any project updates. I know I have one, so I'll mention the one I've got. Uh, Sakai 10.5 has been released. It has a hundred and about a hundred. It has 116 uh, fixes in it. So um, I sent out the notification this morning to the technical community, and then was planning on drafting up something um, a bit more uh, sort of high level for the broader community. Basically, just saying, you know, we have some security fixes, and 116 fixes, and 10.5 is now the official um, tagged uh, community release. And the Sakai core team recommends that if at all possible, that folks uh, upgrade to Sakai 10.5. Um, I think it's, it's 116 actually, not 160. So 116. Um, any other announcements? Or from uh, either announcements or project updates? Going once, going twice. Okay, so um, the next thing here is that uh, Wilma would like to get some, some uh, feedback on uh, a Morpheus issue. So go ahead uh, if you've got your audio. Hi everybody, um, I just wanted to get some quick uh, reactions from folks on a couple of ideas that they've been tossing around in the Morpheus check-in. I'm actually gonna paste the URL in um, to the chat where you can view the image um, instead of doing the screen share because I think it might be a little quicker. But Neil, I don't know if you want, if you have screen share if you want to pull it up for the recording. Um, but basically, if you go to that link, you should see an image with sort of three different uh, iterations of um, the site tabs at the top of Sakai. And so this is kind of the uh, an approximation of the design that they're thinking of right now. Um, as you see, the, the site tabs run along the second row um, all the way across, and we're just looking at the top. I, I just cropped out everything else um, since we're focused really uh, specifically on one item in the site tabs at the top. Um, so you'll see over toward the right-hand side, there's a, um, three different options there. There's a, a number with the chevrons pointing down. Um, which would indicate the number of additional site tabs that are available to that user. There's um, the a plus sign with the number and then the little chevrons pointing down and then there's the word more with the chevrons pointing down. So um, we were just interested to see which of those options was more appealing to people, which one was, was more intuitive in terms of um, letting people know that they have um, additional sites that they could view. Well, I can't get to the chat box because it's covered up with the screen share, but my thought is I prefer the more option. I don't really need to know the number and that's kind of a what's that number for kind of thing. Okay, anybody else? The number, incidentally, would be the number of additional sites that you have, and that would be dynamic because what they're talking about is um, instead of having uh, the sites kind of wrap around to a second line, if the screen gets smaller, um, sites would sort of fall off of the list at the top, um, but they would the number would update to reflect the number of sites. Right, I, under, I understand that, but I'm thinking as a teacher who's trying to figure out what all what that means. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, it's more intuitive to me to think about the more rather than the number. Okay, 
So it looks like most people like more. Is there? Does anybody want to make an argument for one of the other ones? Um, Trisha at the University of Virginia. I I actually like having the number there. I think that is um, it, it, use information um, unless, of course, you have thousands of sites and, and they might. <laughs> Too much information. Um, you know, more, I and mean, I know we're all all used to that. Um, uh, so uh, I, you know, I don't feel strongly about it. I always like that um, sort of. I don't remember what you call that um, band that that indicates a number of things. Um, I think that you know, becoming more of a trend. And therefore, I that's that's one that's why I like it. Okay. Any other thoughts from anybody else? I have a question, Wilma. Are you mm -hmm. talking about restraining the tabs to one row? You wouldn't have the option of having more tabs showing, so you've got two or three rows there. Right. Okay. That's that's a bigger difference than I thought it was. This is Terry, by the way, at KCU. Okay, I know a couple of people commented that if you have a whole bunch of sites, the number might not be meaningful. Right. So if you have like 28 or 30 something sites, um, that might be a little too much information. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, okay. All right, well, um, unless anybody has any other comments, I don't want to take too much agenda time. So um, thanks, everyone, for your input, and I will relay this information back to the Morpheus team. Thanks, Wilma. So uh, the uh, next item on the agenda is, um, okay, let me turn off screen sharing. Or I guess I can keep it on and then do the JIRA over here. Let's see. I'll also paste it in the chat. So this is, um, JIRA is about compressing a zip archive um, on a hidden folder. And right now, what happens is if you compress, uh, compress items to a zip, they are, the zip is public, but it's possible that either the folder level is not visible to, to students um, or that a subfolder is invisible. Um, I think from the brief discussion that, that is on here, to me, the thing that makes the most sense, I'm curious if other people agree, is um, that by default, the zip be hidden. And that way, you don't have to worry about all kinds of business rules or going through and making it complex. Was the subfolder hidden? It's just that a zip would always be hidden. Keep it really simple. And then the instructor can always, you know, unhide that if they want the whole zip and the whole structure available um, to students. So take a minute or so and take a look at that. Hi, Terry. You said, I guess you didn't follow the thread. Um, we're discussing the JIRA of the week, which is uh, um, how this is in the resources tool. And you can create a zip. Well, so what can, what you can, what can happen is that you can create a zip file by, um, you know, choosing, let's say, a folder in the resources and turning it into a zip. And let's say the folder is actually hidden from students, but when you create the zip, the zip shows up in the resources and the zip is visible. So now content that you have uh, at one point in time, at least, that I don't want to be visible to students now, now is, is visible through, through the zip because a student can download the zip file. They have access to all the content. Does that help? You can't hide the zip file? You can, but by default, it would be unhidden. So the instructor would then have to remember to uh, unhide it, I mean, to hide it, rather. Now, are you zipping it in resources? I didn't know you could yes. do that. Yeah, you're zipping it in resources, yeah. That's a feature in resources. 
Oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. It sh I'm, I'm kind of watching the chat, and it seems like it should be with the default. I don't know why it should pop over to some other state of being. Well, so one of the other, other problems of it is that, uh, let's say the top level folder is, um, is visible, but let's say some sub subfolder, because the fo top folder, of course, can have many subfolders and levels, levels of subfolders. Let's say one of those levels of subfolders is, is hidden. Um, then, then what should the zip be? Then should it still be visible because the top level is visible? But that might mean that some hidden subfolder within that is, you know, now is visible that wasn't intended to be. So that's where it gets a little bit more more complicated. Yeah, the the, the two logic the, the logical thing does seem to be just whatever the um, the the folder is that you're zipping is. If that's hidden, make the zip hidden. If it's if it's visible, make the zip visible. But then the problem then where it gets complicated is well, what if that top level folder actually has a subfolder that's that's invisible? So I'm seeing some comments. Um, I think maintaining the visibility of the parent source folder files is desirable. I think it should remain hidden by default. And then another one said, yeah, maintain previous visibility. Um, Louisa writes that she has an opposite problem when she uploads a zip file that is unzipped into a folder automatically, which is what I don't want. I upload a zip file because I want to share it with others. Ah, okay, Louisa, I'll have to check on that because I don't know if that's an option or if that's a property in Sakai or if that's just the way it behaves. Um, and if, if it's just the way it behaves, and if others have that same issue, then that might be a, a JIRA that we might want to open. Let's see. I'm not sure I could imagine zipping a folder for students with a hidden subfolder. Could you be overthinking the problem? Well, that's the point of bringing it up. <laughs> so, so we see what the opinions are. Um, uh, I like keeping the same visibility of the uh, the zip folder. Okay. So, whichever folder is zipped. Right. The the mixed the mixed set the mixed uh, issue hidden visible is the is the where it's a little bit confusing and it says I think Diego writes I think a quick solution should be to advise about that with the text the zip file will be visible to all users in the site if you want to maintain it hidden you need to go to the properties of the file and hide it. Sometimes your messages are just simpler that way. Okay. Maintain the visibility of the parent source files for folders. Okay, thanks. That's great feedback. I'll, I'll make a summary and I'll put it into that JIRA uh, based on this feedback. And if you want to follow the JIRA, there's a little, you know, watcher thing. You, if you log into JIRA, uh, you have to log in first and then be on that issue. You can click on start watching the issue. And that, any new comments that come in, you automatically see them. Uh, let's see, item is grayed out to indicate visibility, so status should be transparent to users. Ha uh ha. -huh. Okay. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to stop screen sharing, and we're going to now introduce our friends uh, from Xerti, or I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Julian was going to be on here as well, but uh, he had a uh, minor medical issue that he had to attend to, um, a dental thing, so uh, I'll hand it over to uh, to Ron, Faye, or Inga. Uh, thanks, Neil. I think um, this is Ron. I think I'm going to um, kick off. Um, as you mentioned, um, my colleagues, Faye Cross from the University of Nottingham and Inga Donkervolt from the Netherlands and the Xerti community are both here as well. So I'm hoping they'll correct me if I make any mistakes or respond to questions um, in the, the text, text chat and so on. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen, um, but I'll paste in the text chat a link to resource that we created um, for this session. So hopefully I'll be able to um, share that screen as well. Not 
seeing. Okay. Jar replit took a bit while to fire up. Oh, there it comes. I'm sorry, it's only come up. Okay. I'm going to stop that and choose a region instead. Um, just a second. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you're um, seeing this resource. Um, as you mentioned, Neil, um, unfortunately, um, Julian had to dip out the last minute um, for a, a dental appointment, in fact. And I was going to make a joke if you excuse my UK and East End humour. Um, it does sometimes seem a bit like pulling teeth to persuade, particularly learning technologists, to, to see the light and to see the the value of Xerti. Um so <laughs> hopefully I'll convince a, we'll convince a few of you while um, we answer these questions that were posed in advance um, to its value. Um, Julian was going to do the intro and a, and a very quick intro about the history of the project. Be useful to know. I think there's a kind of hands up facility in Big Blue Button. Um, be useful to know how many people saw the presentation at. Um, the Aperio conference in Baltimore, and how many, for instance, don't know anything about Xerti. So, a quick show of hands if you, perhaps a quick show of hands if you don't know anything about Xerti at all. Okay, so you said you don't know. A hands thing here that people can put in the chat. I don't think there's a. Uh, okay. Yeah. But, and then just okay. uh, monitor the chat part. Um, um, to use using so many uh, different conferencing tools, it's it's difficult sometimes to know which which has which features. Um, okay, so we'll we'll start from the perspective that um, not many people know too much about Xerti, if anything at all. Um, what you'll see in this resource that you've got the link to now is a recording of that. Um, presentation we did. Um, but just as a very quick overview, um, the project actually started in around 2004. Julian Tenney uh, started work at the University of Nottingham, and th at that time it was a focus on developer tools and, and very much kind of making developing e learning content um, much more efficient. Um, the online version that we know today, and, and officially it's known as Xerti Online Toolkits, but it, it generally just gets referred to as Xerti these days. And the developer tool has kind of lost, um, the desktop developer tool has, has lost focus. That was kind of flash only anyway. Some people still use it and dedicated to it, particularly those that came from the Authorware community. Um, but all of our efforts, all of our development, and the ease of use that comes for everyone is from the online version that, as I say, officially is known as Xerti online toolkits, but um, Xerti is kind of used interchangeably, and, and obviously the, the project is the Xerti project overall as well. Um, what it is is a free open source online multi platform authoring tool. Um, we'll talk more about that and explore um, how it works. And what it does is create highly accessible um, out of the box with not really having to know too much of the technicalities of that accessibility. Um, highly accessible online and, and mostly mobile friendly learning objects. And we'll, we'll contextualize that mostly um, that I mentioned just there um, as we go through. Um, widespread adoption, especially in the UK where it started, but, but also worldwide. Um, it's award winning and um, <coughs> very popular across the world. Uh, we have kind of three core values. Um, the first one is to maintain ease of use for anyone and everyone. So sometimes we actually leave potential features out just to maintain that kind of ease of use for everybody. And sometimes that's um, led to um, all sorts of debates amongst the developer community. Um, and of course, people, because it's open source, can add their own developments. And um, we have a workflow where they can be committed and accepted or you know, left as bespoke 
um, customizations. And if anyone's got any questions about customization, then maybe Faye will pick up on some of those things. Who's uh, Faye's been involved for many years at the University of Nottingham. Ingram and myself are, um, are from the kind of wider community, although I've been working with the team at Nottingham almost since day one as well. Um, ease of use, the high accessibility, and we do have a mature and well-established community, and not just the community of developers, but a well-established user and teaching and learning community. Um, I have to say not many of those are, are Sakai users, from my knowledge, but they do use um, all sorts of other VLEs, not just um, VLEs like Moodle. And so we're kind of, you know, we'll work, <laughs> we'll work with any VLE, and, and you'll see some examples of that shortly. So embedded in this resource, as I'm scrolling up, and you can view on your local machines anyway, is the recording that we did um, in Baltimore. And just to go back up the top there, we have a, a comprehensive overview resource that we used as the focus of um, our talk in Baltimore, which you can view in your own time and has a lot more in-depth info about the, the tools and the history and our choice of, of the Aperio Foundation and our route through incubation and, and so on. What I really wanted to quickly get to was the um, the questions that Neil kindly shared in advance. Um, and I've kind of changed the order of these slightly just to get through the, the quick and uh, easy ones to answer uh, straight away. And then we'll get on to kind of a live demo and, and any new questions that have cropped up. So first question here is, is Zerti already LTI enabled? Um, we do have some LTI 1 support, and, and that was originally developed as a, a kind of LTI integration with Moodle. So you can enable that, and um, basically when you're in Moodle, you can um, select the external tool option and browse to your learning objects and select the one that you want to embed, and that automatically sits in there. We don't have, I don't think, the, the, the kind of the account creation functionality that's, that's one of the selling points of LTI. Um, and as Tom um, has indicated here, at the moment, our focus really is on XAPI integration rather than LTI. Um, that's a kind of higher priority for us. Um, but we'd certainly be keen to speak to anyone that, that wants to join us amongst the developer community and, and help towards um, improving the LTI and XAPI support. Um, does Zerti have CAS support? Um, at the moment, there isn't any specific support for CAS. Um, but um, as Thomas said here, it shouldn't be difficult to add. Um, we do have rudimentary SAML2 support um, in the, the, the current release, the beta release, which will soon be an official release. Um, and if you need CAS support, the developer community, in particular Tom, um, can probably help you out with that. Um, another question here, the biggest hold up for us is not knowing where to begin. Um, and I've kind of added some bullet points here. Um, there are quite a few options. Firstly, you can install locally for those of you that are um, developers or use local web servers like XAMPP. Um, you can install Zerti via that and uh, you can use that for testing and development. Um, and development in terms of both creating learning objects, but also development in terms of customizing and improving the tool and, and adding your own um, bespoke page types and things, which, again, Faye can, can advise on if you've got specific questions about that. Um, you can install it on yourself on your own web server. It basically is a PHP and MySQL application. So if you have an existing web server, um, you can uh, install yourself and get free support from the Zerti developer community. Um, we have forums and we have separate mailing lists where there's lots of free support. Um, there is also, and I know this is sometimes a, a barrier to people, there is also um, paid for support, both in installing on your own server and uh, with ongoing support or with external hosting. And I'll just put a little um, footnote in there where you can contact me or Inga um, if you want to discuss that kind of thing further. And there's also a, a link to uh, a blog page on the Gist Tech Dis from the, the UK, the Gist Tech Dis Accessibility Organization, which unfortunately is kind of no more in its previous guise. Um, 
in a blog post because they used to ha host a sand pit, which um, lots of people use as their first point of call to to explore Xerti. But really, the the evidence is out there now. You don't really need to to pilot or test it. Um, it's a very small footprint application and can can sit just on just about any web server that has PHP and MySQL. So there's not really a need for for that kind of sand pit provision. Um, I've embedded a, a, a video from, we used to have um, monthly just tech this 30 Fridays and there's one there that actually is about an hour long that talks through the considerations for installation and um, makes the point that it's not just a, um, a job for IT and it isn't a one time only install either which um, I'm sure you'll identify with um, given the mention of 116 um, fixes in the next release of Sakai. Um, so a big question here was how to develop um, learning objects with Xerti and we'll, we'll get to that and do a, a demo very quickly. Um, what we did in bed here, we ran two short um, workshops on the Sunday in Baltimore um, and unfortunately I've forgotten the name so if you're in the audience and you recognize these screenshots here um, then put in the text chat that <laughs> it was you that created these but we we obviously had people that were brand new to Xerti um, and during those workshops here's an example of uh, a learning object they created during that workshop and embedded in the Sakai um, lesson um, tool and there's some tips there as well that um, I have a feeling it might have been someone named Alan that um, created this some tips as to what he needed to do to get it to work in um, the Sakai installation that he was using. And then there's a second screenshot here where somebody did the reverse almost and embedded a Sakai forum inside a Xerti learning object. And we um, and obviously you can do the two things combined. So you can have a learning object sitting inside Sakai and when you want a kind of discussion or assessment that is coming from Sakai, embed that in the Desserty learning object too. Um, there was a question about integration with the Sakai gradebook um, and what I've done is kind of answered that here in terms of we do have SCORM 1.2 and SCORM 2004 export options and um, mentioned the fact that at the moment it's the quiz page and the multiple choice page and I think one or two others Inga will be able to um, point that out in the text chat um, that do score tracking but a lot of the interactions that we have in Xerti um, are uh, not really really appropriate for score tracking as such so if you export a SCORM and import into uh, a VLE like Sakai depending on that that SCORM interpretation and I'm sure you all appreciate that sometimes VLEs interpret that, um, that SCORM standard differently um, you should get those scores tracked in the grade book and you should get things like um, when the when the learning object was first accessed, uh, duration on each page, when it was finished and so on, along with the scores. And obviously there's some configuration in Xerti as to how to um, track that score and in terms of the, the value of the scores and so on. And now there's a challenge for you at the bottom of this in terms of there's a, a link to not only view that um, SCORM example, but to download um, the SCORM example. And if you know much of what we're going to continue to to cover, perhaps try importing that into Sakai um, while we're talking and then report back um, at the end of the talk as to how that worked and whether that worked. and and what scores were tracked because there is a, a quiz as part of that object. So you'll be able to see that in there. Um, what I wanted to quickly do, and this is a bit of a um, an experiment, but hopefully going to work. Um, okay, so. Bear with me just a minute. Um. 
I'm going to mention uh, that uh, Inga mentioned that categories, multiple choice quiz, multiple choice questions um, are included and more will follow. And uh, better use user T online toolkits for that because this will be a tool that they'll develop further. And I'm saying it out loud versus in the chat because when we convert this over to YouTube, we found that we lose um, the items in the chat. So I want to make sure that was, uh, was captured. Okay, um, unfortunately, um, what I prepared is a, a bit of a diagram um, in advance of um, the session. Um, it seemed to want to work now, so I'll go back to um, the idea of a live demo. Um, hopefully, you're seeing my screen here, and what I'll quickly do is paste in the text chat, although it's a, a link in the um, in the resource you just had, um, a link to our comprehensive overview resource. Um, that includes links to lots of examples. And if I quickly um, just navigate through here, if I go to the history page, there's a, a bit of an animated video of the story so far, and then um, examples of the earlier learning objects and templates that we had. Um, in the how and why, there's a, there's a whole load of um, further explanation as to um, how Xerti works and some examples and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm sure you're keen to um, see how it works. Um, put another quick example link in the bottom. We have what we call a technical demonstrator. Um, so I put that link in the text chat. This isn't a real learning object in terms of its its intention isn't a particular topic of learning. It's just a technical demonstrator and a reminder of all the page types that we have. Um, and in the interface, if you click the, the table of contents button, you'll see that it actually goes through in the order that we have them in the, in the authoring tool in terms of the first set are some fairly ordinary text pages and then some media pages, uh, navigator pages. And then there's a whole series of interactivity type pages. So if I just quickly go to that, um, there's the stimulating question, and then the button sequence, interactive list, uh, multiple choice question. And then there's some that I thought we might choose to do a quick live demo of, which is uh, things like the hotspot and animated annotated image. So if I click on the, um, the diagram here, you'll see that actually what you get is and some explanation of those those spots that are, are indicated. So the way that kind of thing is created, um, this is the the offering environment, which now works on tablet devices as well as desktops and laptops. So you can not just consume on tablet devices, but also offer on them. Um, what I would do here is click Create to um, create a project. Um, but what I'm going to just select is one that I started earlier just so that there's some um, content already in there and select the edit button to bring up the editor. Well, of course in true fashion because I prepared too early it's um, signed me out so I'm just going to sign back in so that um, see the editor again. So this is our um, editor, it's form based, hopefully you're seeing this um, clearly enough. And what we get is we go to the insert menu and we've got this category of text pages. And as we hover over, we get a little kind of explanation and a thumbnail of what that page looks like. So just to demonstrate adding an interactive page, I'm going to select interactivity and select hotspot image, for instance. And I'll add that um, at the end. So what that gives us the ability to do is click to upload an image that we want to add hotspots to. Um, and I um, added some already, but I could browse to my local machine and add those in there. Um, and then I can just double click and add that image. And then what we want to do is add a hotspot to it. So for instance, if I click hotspot, it will give me a, a little thumbnail of the, the picture that I've uploaded. And then I can drag to, um, to select that and move the hotspot. So here, for instance, is the hotspot of the embed code that we get. Uh, click OK. And I can name the title here 
embed code and I can put my explanation in here and although these are just plain text boxes if I click on the, the toolbar we now have a fully WYSIWYG um, toolbar um, the same toolbar that you use in Sakai I believe so um, we have the ability to add images here and, and other media and so on I just click publish and click play Um, these are the, the first two pages that I added and here's the third page is the one that I just added and if I click on that hotspot I happen to know where it is but obviously I could try and find it um, I click on it and there's my little description that I just added um, I close that and close out by default everything you create is private um, and if I select that demo project and go to properties um, and then the access tab I can change that default private to public once I've done that I go back to the project tab I have a normal link which I can immediately copy and for instance paste in the text chat um, but I can also copy embed code and when it comes to the question that we had about how do you um, Great Zerty learning objects and embed in Sakai. Um, obviously, this is the simplest way that you would do it. You would um, make the project public, grab either the plain link or the embed code, and add that wherever you want in Sakai. The other option we have is to click on exports, and we have a deployment export that will give you a zip file and just you can upload to any web server or a, a blog or, a, or Sakai and extract and that will give you just normal web content without the kind of SCORM tracking and we have the SCORM 1.2 and 2.4 tracking we also have an offline export for the main template which allows that to work um, because it's dynamic content and loads XML we have a special format that um, will work on any browser and without the kind of um, security prompts that you might get with the normal deployment zip I'm conscious there's probably been um, questions in the text chat that I missed and um, and maybe questions that have arisen from this so I'll stop the, the screen sharing for a moment and um, perhaps we can pick up that and um, if Inga or they want to respond via audio I can I can see if I can get my um, demo that I wanted to do my other explanation um, working correctly Hi, this oh, is were there any oh sorry I was just gonna answer on the question to you <laughs> yeah, go on, go, go ahead. Go, give me a breather and I can try and get my air server working. I'm Faye Cross, by the way, at the University of Nottingham. Um, I'm just going to answer Andrew's question. He asked, are hotspots click only or is the rollover possible? Um, off the top of my head, I think that all the pages with hotspots, you have to click on them to get the information, but it's quite easy to. Um, Easily um, uh, add in um, about 50 different page types, I think. So there might be one with rollover stuff in that I've forgotten about. But um, head, I think it's all clear. And um, Dave, um, you said you have you don't have a SCORM player in your instance of Sakai. Um, if you don't have a SCORM player, you can't track the, the scores or the results of the student. We are working on the X API and maybe things will be easier then, but at the moment it's, it's just the SCORM packages. Yes, TinCan is the commercial name for X API. Ron, is it an idea that Faye shows some of the page types uh, as you are looking for your demo? Uh, Inga, yeah. Um, 
I'm just about to bring up the demo, but I'll do that very quickly um, and then hand over to Faye for the um, the templates. Um, what I wanted to just very quickly um, talk about here is that what we've already kind of discussed is that we have, um, I hope this is clear enough, we have a, a web server application. So when you're authoring, you're authoring online and um, the server is serving the tool and what you're populating and uploading in terms of media and graphics um, is all online. Obviously, um, you can then um, have that content go to um, Sakai. And as we've talked about, you can either use a link or um, embed code to have that in Sakai, or you can use um, the export functionality to, to have that as SCORM. And as has just been said, not everybody has got um, the SCORM module in, installed in Sakai. Um, obviously, you need um, learners to then consume that. And in your normal kind of VLE metaphor, you have a course, you have your learning content, and the, the learners are accessing that um, from the VLE. Um, well that's well and good, but obviously you do usually have um, accounts in those courses. And so any content that's kind of uploaded to the VLE, either embedded or uploaded directly, is a is a little bit restricted in terms of only people with access to those courses can see that content. Um, but with Xerti, you get the best of both worlds because it's an external to the VLE tool. Um, all of that content can also be sent directly to those learners, either as an email link or as a public link. And obviously, it might not be just learners. It might be um, other organizations that you want to share content with but can't give access to your, your VLE because of the, the kind of account metaphor or just because it's protected content or whatever. Um, and also because of that, we have this notion of um, actually working with any VLE. So Xerti doesn't really care whether it's Sakai, Moodle, Canvas, Blackboard anywhere basically because the content is sitting inside an external offering tool. Um, the learners get the same experience and more importantly um, if you look at this diagram now one Xerti learning object embedded in five different VLEs if you like um, update it once add a new page add a new interaction add a new bit of media and click publish and it's automatically updated in all of those places. Obviously, if you've exported as um, SCORM, that won't be the case. You would have to repeat that export and import functionality. And one of the reasons that Tom and, and all of us are excited about the X API potential is the idea of still having all that benefit of being able to quickly add and update in one place, but also have the tracking that um, Tinkan X API provides that um, SCORM wouldn't do because you have to do the export. Um, step. So hopefully that's a quick um, contextualization, but we see this very much as uh, we'll support any and typically the content is just web standard HTML5 content, so should work fine, um, and adds that real value that, that you can't really achieve with content directly created and embedded in a VLE. I'll shut up for now and, and hand over to, to Faye to, to talk about some new templates. Hi Ron, are you going to um, show them on your screen or I'm not a presenter, I don't think, to share my screen? Okay, yeah, Faye, if you tell me what you want me to um, show. Um, okay, um, I was just going to talk about some of the um, ways that you can um, customise your installation. Um, so um, if you You've all seen the um, interface, the standard one, where it's all black and white, header and footer. Um, so you can customise that to suit your institution, company, whatever. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in big open plan noisy office, so if there's a lot of background noise, I'm sorry about that. Um, so there's, um, you can do that quite easily just with the style sheets, and that will be the default um, 
change the default interface for any projects people make. But we've also added um, new theme options that give the users uh, choice choices about how their project looks. Um, so, and you can add new themes. So Ron showing there, there's a theme option for a project um, with quite a few different options. So this could, for example, be used so that you have a different theme for different courses or however you really want to use it. Um, you can also, um, although we do have quite a lot of different page types, um, sometimes people come across things that they can't think of a way how they could do it with the existing page types. So um, it's reasonably easy to create a new page type. Um, and to do that, um, you do need to be a developer really to understand how to do that. So uh, the end users wouldn't be able to do it, but the page types are made of two parts. So there's um, an XML file that says how the um, project looks in the editor. So the fields someone has to complete in order to make a page. So you have to create an XML file describing that. And then you make a page model file, which um, describes how that information is then translated onto the screen for the end user. Um, so that's just with HTML, uh, CSS, and um, JavaScript, jQuery. So you can easily plug in new page types, and then they would appear in the insert menu along with all the existing ones. Um, we'd love more people to create new page types um, and share them with the community. Um, and some of the new newer page types that Ron might be able to show are um, we have one called the decision tree template. Um, if you look in the I'll share a link on in the chat actually, which has got some. Okay, so I've just shared a link um, which shows some examples of the two newest page types that we've got. Um, the d decision tree one, which um, basically is a way of translating a flowchart or something like that into um, a toolkit page. So you uh, answer a series of questions, and then depending on the answers you give, uh, you're given a result. Um, and the other new page is the media lesson page, um, where you can sync different types of content to a video or audio file. Um, so you can get the video to pause, for example, at a particular point, pose a question. And then depending on the answer that someone gives, it could either give them a piece of feedback or jump them to another point in the video or to a different page in the toolkit project. Um, Okay. But yeah, as I said, we would love more people to develop new page types um, and share them with everyone. Cheers. Did you want to say something about the community side of things, Inga? Um, sorry, there are a lot of questions, so I was trying to answer them. <laughs> I did that in the chat, uh, Neil, sorry. Uh, the community uh, website, uh, I added the link in the in the chat, is uh, www.xeta.org.uk, and you can find a lot of information there. Um, there is a, uh, a sand pit you can use in the Netherlands to try it out for a month, but that's still the old version. Um, and as soon as the Xeta 3.0 is released, we will um, add the new one there. But functionalities are the same. Um, so look, uh, take a look at the community website and uh, see all kinds of examples and information about uh, 30. Uh, I think we have to wrap it up and go back to Neil. Um, Neil? Yes, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, we like to wrap up in the final 